Hello, I'm Jeff, Executive Vice President here at Amoco Brent. Over 100 years ago, my grandfather founded Amoco. Today, my brother and I carry on his legacy. Our team works diligently to bring you the best clays, glazes, equipment, and more for your studio and a classroom. This week's episode is brought to you by Amoco Brent. Please find your favorite Amoco or Brent product at your local distributor today. Thank you for choosing Amoco for all your clay and glaze needs. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 462 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, we're coming back to a series that started last year called Meet the Parents. For the series, I invited artist couples to talk with each other about finding balance between creative work and life as a parent. Today's interview features Mallory Weatherill and Matt Zimke. The couple are based in Kearney, Nebraska, where Mallory is the head of ceramics at the University of Nebraska Kearney and Matt is a senior lecturer and gallery director. They've both been on the show before, so if you'd like to learn more about their careers and work, you can check out those episodes. You can also go to their website, which is MalloryRetheral.com or MattZimke.com. Before we get to that, I wanted to announce that I'll be during the Clay Center of New Orleans' upcoming exhibition, Less is More. This juried exhibition is open to ceramic vessels, sculptures, and wall-mounted works and celebrates earthenware clay and low-fire surface techniques. The application deadline for that is April the 15th, so if you're listening to this, that's coming up real soon. You can apply today at nolaclay.org slash calls for entries. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Hey everyone, this is Mallory Weatherill, and I'm guest hosting this episode of the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast. I'm here with my partner in crime and in life, Matt Zimke, and we're going to talk a bit about parenting and finding balance between work and life. We live in Kearney, Nebraska, where we teach at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. I'm an associate professor of ceramics, and Matt is a senior lecturer and the university's gallery director. When we're not making and teaching, we're wrangling our two kids. Corinne, age eight, and Kellen, age four. So I'm going to start off the sort of conversation today in talking about, you know, how parenting affected us as makers, you know, how we had to adjust or, you know, shift our creativity uh, to make room for these little beings in our life. So Matt, I'm going to sort of just ask you to sort of talk a bit about that to get this conversation rolling. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Well, I, (laughs) I think that the first thing that uh, comes to mind when I I think all the way back to when we transitioned from just two artists, you know, making it in the world to two artists with a baby. uh, I think that like, you know, figuring out sleep was the first real hurdle. I mean, aside from figuring out how to. Do you think we have figured that out? Because I'm still in Kellett's bed every night. No, I don't. I don't think that that's figured (laughs) out yet. It sucks. But um, we're getting there, you know. And, um, you know, there are there were so many mornings that were like 4 a.m. mornings. And we didn't get I didn't get to go back to sleep or you didn't get to go back to sleep. And 
you know, I think that just embracing the fact that that first year you're on survival mode and everyone's got to understand that. Um, if your friends who don't have kids are badgering you about going out, sorry, tough, tough shit. I've got a, a, per, a little person to keep alive and I've got myself to maintain in this relationship to keep going too. So, you know, um, you have to ultimately be really selfless, selfless and also really selfish if that makes sense, selfless in what you give to your partner and your child. And then also selfish in that, like we're protecting this until we can like actually swing it to go out to dinner with people and let my kids throw food all over the restaurant and embarrass us to no end. Well, I was just going to say, and as makers, I think it was, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword being uh, tethered to an, a fellow maker because, um, you know, you're at the whim of the world and always, you know, see, going after the jobs. And um, sometimes you're up against the same jobs as your partner. But um, that was really helpful for us. I think the fact that we were both creative individuals, so we understood um, the need to get to the studio while we were also, you know, trying to adapt as a new with a, with a new human and um, a constantly changing nor new normal. Um, and so I think that was really huge for us uh, because we did not have a support system here in Nebraska either. Um, so yeah. I don't know. Um, that was very helpful, I think. I was going to say, I just, I really, I really think that's huge. You know, um, what you said about understanding, you know, I mean, um, just the demands of what, what it is that we do. And, you know, if there's someone out there listening to this, who is, you know, uh, a, a dedicated maker and um, thinking about having, you know, their first kid with their spouse who maybe doesn't fully understand the what it takes to really continue to succeed with something so demanding as, as an art practice. Um, you know, I think that it would be good to really set those expectations beforehand, like say, you know, I, I, I don't know how that conversation goes because we had a very unique uh, and I think fortunate situation, but um, it was, it was like just so demanding. It was like, okay, you know, we're splitting, we, we still split weekends. It's like, you know, normal families in Nebraska are all sitting home watching the Huskers. Thank God we don't have to do that, but you know, we're like still splitting weekends and it's a, it's a vibe. Yeah. I think what we choose to do uh, as makers, it's, it's totally a lifestyle choice, um, which can be exhausting in some ways, but I think making your children privy to that early on is really important because um, ultimately kids, I think, are really resilient and adaptable and flexible and understanding little creatures. And so, um, you know, not only do I have a supportive uh, partner, but I also have a, a supportive children. And the fact that, like, I just left my family for six weeks to go do that residency in Taos um, at, at Ken Price's estate. and. Um, I think for people who are not makers, uh, to see a mother leave her family and do that, um, I looked really selfish from the outside looking in and, and that is selfish in, in one regard, but, um, ultimately I did it to better serve, you know, myself and my students. And ultimately that better serves my, my family too, taking the time to reconnect with, um, you know, what got me into this field in the first place uh, was huge. And so, so yeah, so let's talk about, um, you know, these sort of changes over time and how we have learned to adapt to being makers and parents. Mm. Or have we? <laughs> I think we're still learning. I mean, well, that that might be an interesting segue to what I'm doing ultimately, you know. But we'll we'll leave that till later. But uh, I I think that you know being willing to like to figure it out on the fly. Uh, you know, everyone wants to have a great little plan of how life's going to go, and how their kids going to be like this, and they're going to do this and that, and it's all going to be just this way. And the reality is, then like none of that actually goes that way or rarely does it, you know? And so one of the things that I think we're really good about is being flexible. You know, um, we have our, we definitely have our preferred like time of day to work. I'm a morning person. You are not, that is not when you prefer to work, <laughs> but like, you know, we, we, fig we just kind of figure it out 
and we always we always have. Um, and it's going to be very different for every single person. So I can't really give any kind of specific advice other than this general idea of be ready to like figure it out on the fly. Your plans are sometimes, if not always, well, if not often, not going to go as planned. I think that's one thing that I definitely, <laughs> definitely learned and I'm still learning. Well, and I think also like, um, you know, bringing it back to the parenting aspect is bringing your kids into the studio, letting them see what you do and also establishing boundaries within your studio. Like we have a, um, you know, Corinne is allowed to touch her things in the studio, but she's not allowed to touch certain shelves in mine. And, uh, and she's known that from an early age. Um, and, you know, when we do events through the university that are ceramic based, Corinne is actively a part of them. Kellen often likes to come too. And so they get to see what we're doing. Um, and I think that's helpful for when we have to leave you know, on Saturday afternoons or on a weeknight to make a deadline, they understand where we're going and why we're doing it. Um, they might not like it and they would might prefer that we stay and, you know, watch a show with them or make build something out of Legos. But ultimately, I think they get it because we've been making them a part of it since they were little. And I think that's been very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say, too, that 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 kind of translates into, uh, I think, effective parenting beyond just the studio. Like, I think you're right, you know, acclimatizing them to the studio, having boundaries. They love coming up to up to the studio and playing with clay and, and horsing around and going to the clay club events. And I love that. But it's also like get them involved in baking stuff and, and you know, making food and yard work and like the stuff that is just the daily grind of, well, quote unquote, grind, the stuff you just do in life. But for a kid to just be engaged with whatever their parents are doing is really, they, I just think they really love it. Yeah, I think it's really valuable. Yeah, well, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, how our work has changed since becoming a parent. I know, um, I know that my process and what I am making has changed uh, just because time is so precious and there's never enough of it. Um, and then you are having a really big shift that we'll touch on in a moment, um, partially from the field and then partially from parenting and just life in general. So I'll talk a little bit about how my work has shifted focus um, since becoming a parent. Um, so when I had endless time, I was able to uh, I make really detailed work that's really graphic uh, in, in imagery on the surface. And I used to be able to spend, you know, so many hours just on building a, a canvas and then spending so much time surfacing. And so after Corinne was born in 2014, I realized I was only making like three pieces a year and um, that wasn't going to be sustainable to, I don't know, remain visible in the field, but also get promotion because I wasn't able to get, um, be, you know, participate in enough shows. And so I had to really scale down the size of my work and the type of canvases that I was doing um, or making in order to surface. Um, and so from that functional work has, and it's funny because I, I don't consider myself a potter because my forms are not resolved in any way. They're, they're merely canvases, but that was a big shift that I saw as a maker, just having to figure out how to still produce and make work that's accessible, but do it with, a, you know, half the time that I had prior to having a child. And so how about you, Matt? Did you see the sort of work you were making sh take a big shift when you became a parent? Um. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to push back a little bit, a little bit on you saying your forms aren't resolved because I think that actually they are. They're just not. Uh, they're not um, resolved from the perspective of like functional pottery with, you know, function at the forefront of your consideration. So I, I want to, I just want to say your forms I think are resolved in their way. Yeah, I try. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I think that making your work, being able to make more, uh, if you have ideas that. If you have more ideas than what you can actually get out, I think that speeding up your process is really good. And I've, I've been, it's been really exciting to, to watch you actually make jewelry and pottery because 
uh, or, or vessels, because I think that those are getting into the hands of people and having a message and an impact over like kind of a broader set of the population than if you had just like, you know, one big sculpture in a museum. Maybe that's not true, but anyway, I, I think that it's been great to have your work out there in, in more ways. So speeding up has been really interesting to watch for you, from my perspective. For me, you know, I don't know that my, I don't know that my work shifted so much as uh, because of parenting, rather than I just kind of realized I was more interested in creating surface and experimenting with blaze materials. And so I ultimately went, I, I, I took more and more time away from the actual making of a, an intricate form and eventually ultimately shifted to making these flat panels that were more or less compositional and experimentation based. So, you know, I, my shift was more, if I if I'm thinking about it now, more just I was trying to follow my nose, you know, a little bit, just really trying to follow what was engaging me, and that's important, you know. You got to follow what you want to do, and if you want to make pots and draw on them, then that's what you got to do, even though you might feel like you're supposed to be doing something different or better or bigger or whatever it is. Yeah, let's talk about that. I think that's really huge because as adults. I don't think it's almost like we need permission. We need permission to make uh, changes and to mix things up. I know that just coming from a background uh, in sculpture, I feel guilty sometimes when I focus solely on these vessels or functional items because I feel like I should be working way more in the conceptual round because that's what I was trained to do. But my, even though, you know, my vessels are rooted in functionality now, they're also still, you know, they're, they're billboards for my politics uh, ultimately. So, you know, I still, they're still content heavy, but there is a little bit of grad school guilt, I think. And I've been out of grad school for well over a decade. And so I think giving yourself permission to make changes and um, do what you need to do in order to stay creative, but also make sure that you are present at home is huge um, because, you know, everybody always says it goes, parenting goes by very quickly, but it really does. And the times that they're little doesn't last very long, that they want to hang out with you. And I think we're seeing that shift with Corinne who's gaining, you know, a lot more independence at the age of eight right now. Um, so let's talk about that permission to make changes because you are having. Um, Go on, say it. What am I having? A, a midlife <laughs> crisis. But Where's my Corvette? Yeah, he's not getting a Lamborghini, you guys. He's, you know, <laughs> not, you're not taking up golf or something. But so, Matt, let's talk about what you are doing right now and what you've kind of been building up to doing over the last two years and, and maybe a little bit of why. Well, I, I don't want to drone on too much about it because the reality is that a lot of stuff has led to this this time in my life. At this point, if if you're going to make something and put it in the world, I think that you really think that it should be there. You have to really believe that it should be there. Um, just speaking from like an, an ecological standpoint, even um, or even just the fact that like time on the time you have on this earth is limited. And so if you're doing something, you better like it. You better feel like it really matters. I mean, if I'm being honest, it's been like years that I just, you know, I felt less and less like the things that I was doing, even though I felt like I was kind of making some interesting stuff and I was really. I was happy in ways. But I felt like I was punching a clock every time I came to the studio. And I was like, just, I kind of was like, man, I just, I got into this because this was an alternative to punching a clock, right? This was, this was different and special. And it wasn't feeling special as much as it had been in the past. But, you know, you spend so much time uh, on something like this. I, I, as artists, like this is like folded up into who we are. Like, it's like, you, you know, you can't just take the art out of the, out of the person, uh, separate the two entirely. I think it's like, there's too much, they're too intertwined. Anyway, um, so it's been checking fewer and fewer boxes for me as far as like, should I make this thing? And and does, is it worth the energy, both mine and also like the carbon footprint to, to do this, to ship this around, to fire it multiple times? 
And so I started set, setting limits for myself, you know, basically putting a timestamp, like saying, okay, well, you need to, you're only at the, say, let's say at the time 35. So that's actually, unfortunately, not very old. So you're going to have to do something with your life. And uh, if you don't, if you're not happy, you don't have 30 years of unhappiness in you. That's not fair to you or your family. So um, it, during this, this kind of like this internal conversation I'm having, you know, I'm continuing to try and turn the wheels and COVID happens. And right at that time, a, one of my colleagues and I, we had put together this proposal for a big public art project that was a part of the 1% for the arts. And it was going to actually be for this, the new STEM building on campus here. And, um, you know, we, she's, uh, Victoria is this, uh, truly masterful, uh, printmaker and illustrator. And, um, you know, we, to get to like work with her and like conceptualize this piece. And I got to, we get to leverage her skill with the pencil and Photoshop. And we leaned on my skill with sculpture and ceramics and glaze. Um, I was like, okay, man, if this is it, if this, if, you're about to make a, a good amount of money and this is going to be a, this is this is a big deal this is like going to be a permanent installation on a university for a long long time so if this doesn't make you happy you need to actually make a change and um you know because of covid things got drawn out and it was like everything during that year or two where it's just like nothing seemed to be normal at all but in that time, you know, we wanted to use these decals to put her illustrations on this work. And, and just to give people an idea of this, this piece, it's a four part frieze. It's about 15 feet long and it has a total relief and in the highest points of about nine inches. And uh, the piece is called Sequence Ad Infinitum. And it sort of examines the um, evolution of human technology and the connections we have with the natural world and ultimately how our technological advancement seems to be distancing ourselves, distancing our species from it. And maybe I can give Ben a link to the image or something so people can see. Yeah, so it's cera it's a ceramic piece that's 15 feet of ceramics. Yeah. And then Victoria's, uh, Victoria Gora Rapaport is her name, and she is an illustrator and printmaker, world renowned. And so we're really lucky to have her in this small pocket of Nebraska. But she... Um, you guys converted her drawings into decals that you had to build a decal printer to then surface these things for. So to just sort of give them the, the breadth of this, this project, it was huge. And you guys beat out and you beat out proposals from across the country to get this. So it was a huge project. And so I think, you know, the outcome of this essentially forced you to reevaluate what your focus is. Right. I, I, like I said, if this can't make you feel like you're in the, doing the right thing, then nothing can at, at all. Absolutely. This is it. Um, and I, I was about to say that, you know, in converting this printer to print and decals, I was just so, once again, just like enamored with the design and the machinery and the process of this mechanical transformation that I was kind of, you know, manifesting. Right. So it ultimately led me to look into engineering fields and uh, because I think that, you know, if I just wanted to have a job and go make money, I could just go get a finance degree, which would be a great option. But that sounds like another kind of hell. So um, I I looked into degrees that I thought would be engaging and which also I thought could do good rather than just make more crap, um, make more stuff. I wanted to maybe look at like environmental engineering or, um, you know, even what ultimately is uh, now going to be, I think, civil engineering. So making, still making crap, but making it on a large scale, but I'm, I'm interested in. Can we, can we dial back that word? Because, oh, you know, I'm this sorry. is a conversation that we're going to have to have, you know, or that we have been having as partners is that yeah. one of us, you know, we, we met as creative individuals uh, who were pursuing, you know, the field of ceramics and now one is leaving that field um and one is still very much like i am still very much engaged in what i'm doing and wanting to do this and so there is um you know that's a whole other you know conversation to sort of like how do you support your partner while they're making this big change and leaving this field because they don't see the value in it but you're still very much tethered to it yeah and i when i say that i don't mean that i 
view what people make as <laughs> as that. That's uh, that's okay because really you're probably making a lot of uh, ceramic artists angry right <laughs> yeah. now. Well, and it's you know so <laughs> this and this is the thing is actually I I will always be in touch with ceramics. Um, I do love it, and I love that you make the work that you do, and I I'll always I think you know keep up with it as much as I can uh, in terms of seeing what's going on. You know, maybe at some point, you know, being able to collect more work. But um, yeah, I just certainly don't mean to put it down. That's that wasn't my intention. I'm think I'm just thinking of what I am doing. So thank you for clarifying that. But I just didn't want to receive a bunch of hate mail. You know, oh, everyone send the hate mail to me. I'll take it. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, so long story short, I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a chemistry class because I know that I can get a. I can, they, they'll they waive the mathematics requirement because it's been like, what, 15 years, years since I was in college, <laughs> something like that. So um, I took chemistry and I liked it. And I, I was like, and I really liked it. Can we say dork? Uh, uh, yeah. Nerd. And so I, I was like, and I, and I did well in it. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just take the second chemistry over the summer since, you know, why not? And ultimately, you know, I just finished up my, my, uh, I just finished up calculus two uh, on Monday. And at every point I'm like, you know, I'm also giving myself the permission to bail on this. Cause it's also, you don't have, I don't have to do this thing. You know, uh, I, there are other things I could do if I'm not happy with, with art. Um, but every time I take a class, even though it's hard, I'm like, oh, actually, I actually am good at math. I actually can do science. I, you know, I do like these things. And so at every point, where I think like this might be it, this might be the breaking point. It's actually just confirming more and more that I actually really like this. And so, um, yeah, I, I, at some point in the near future, um, I'll have to spend two years as a full-time student uh, at, just to, to finish this up, but I'll be, I'll be 40, maybe 41 coming out of it. And I just, I feel like it's the right way to go for me. And um, it, it took, it took a lot of setting myself aside, setting a, my ego aside, setting aside the the expectations that um, I placed upon myself as an artist um, to to do something like this. Did you ever question not doing it because you have children and a family? Yeah, for sure. I mean, to to go full time as a student for two years when your kids are ultimately going to be like, I mean, they'll be what ten and six. Mm -hmm. You know, the financial impact is is huge, and the last thing you know we'd want to do is go into a tremendous amount of debt. Again, we're super fortunate that, you know, working for the university, credits are something that we get. I think it's tricky. I think academia is tricky. Um, you know, we're, we're taught to, if you want to teach, to chase these jobs, move where they are. Um, and you spend so much of your early on in your career wondering where you're going to live in three months and what you're going to do and where insurance is going to come from. And then you land these gigs and you've been warned about people burning out from them or sort of feeling like they're in a groundhog day, you know, when you teach in, in higher ed and, um, but you don't believe it until you're in it. And I think recognizing that you still have 30 years left essentially of, of, of work and to recognize that, you know, this might not be for you and not, and you, you know, it's like uh, you don't want to be, uh, one of those burnt out educators, because that doesn't serve the field. It doesn't serve um, the students. And so recognizing that and getting out while you're still very much still engaged as as a, a mentor, I think is important. It's hard because, too, I, I do, though, like I just Mallory was on sabbatical. She went to Taos for a residency. And I think you've had pretty good a pretty good time this semester, you know. Yeah, I was meant to be a trust funder, I think, just independently still, wealthy. Still waiting for yeah. a trust fund just to show up. But, um, you know, it's I'm really grateful that I got to teach ceramics at least one last time um, because, I, you know, it's tough. I do feel like I have so much to offer them. And I have things that you don't necessarily feel really comfortable in that we, we jumped into this semester. And uh, it was, I don't know, they're, they're, when when it's exciting and... Well, it's it's exciting and rewarding when you feel like you're really getting to leverage all your as many of your skills as you can to show these students what's possible. And I'm not ungrateful for the work that I have been doing for UNK because it's ultimately all been a, a good thing that's led me to 
where I am now and I'm happy where I am um, on a personal level. But, you know, when you're sort of locked into teaching two of the same classes, more, more or less over and over at the lower levels, it's, I, yeah, I don't know. It's Groundhog Day for me. And I, um, yeah. you know, the students are different, but ultimately it's, you're kind of always dealing with the same few problems and I'm speaking for myself. So if someone's out there wringing their hands saying that that's not <laughs> the case, then that's, I'm glad I'm happy for you. <laughs> you I am. Do you think if we, um, I'm asking this as a devil's advocate because I already know the answer, but if we didn't have children, would we have moved on already? From UNK or from our- From academia, academia. maybe. Um, I think that there were some things happening professionally in that first few years that yes. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and I think, you know, and I feel guilty saying that because there's so many good people who are great makers, really skillful, skillful who are who are seeking these tenure track positions and just haven't landed anywhere yet. And I totally got mine by luck and I don't know, Mercury you wasn't in retrograde or so, but you know, I, it could have very been easily been, you know, 20 other humans. And so I feel uh, quite guilty, you know, saying this, but I think if, if we had not had children uh, and we, and insurance wasn't a reality, we would have, you know, made these changes earlier and, and left and gone and figured things out. Uh, and it, and so sometimes I feel sorry for you because I think you're, you know, you're going to be 41 starting this new career with people who are 23. Um, I think you're, you know, you're, you're, you're taking labs right now and your lab partners are 18 um, years old um, and they don't know what to do with you when you say that you're a parent and a, and a grown up, um, you know, but I also think, um, do you think that some of these changes you're making are also for your children? I think that I ultimately have an idea of a lifestyle that I would, I would rather have, honestly, you know, um, in, in the eight years we've been here, almost nine now, and you're right, you know, we we chase the jobs, we chase the jobs. And when you're chasing the jobs, you sort of end up where the job is. And I realized that, you know, this a, a few years ago, really, it was like, gosh, I'd actually really like to choose where I live. Because as nice as Nebraska is in its ways, skiing's at six hours away. And that's something that I realized, like, I just really love. And same with, with climbing. It's like, the closest climbing is the 20 or the 30 foot wall across the parking lot. That's, you know, synthetic. So I, I think that I would like to raise my kids more doing those sort of outdoor activities. And like here, the outdoor activity is hunting. <laughs> uh, yeah. Killing stuff, I guess. I, you know, I don't know. And then that's not, maybe not being totally fair, but um, yeah. so yes, I would like at some point to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take up some job considerations in like, I don't know. Idaho or Washington or Colorado or wherever. And I think too, you know, the fact that the kids are young and my parents are in Denver five and a half hours away, that's not super long, but it's, it's super long. It's a long drive, you know? Um, so I think that as I've gotten older with, with children, with a family, I kind of look around and go, gosh, I, I'd like to do some of the things that I grew up doing that I really find fulfilling. And it's hard when you only have like you know, you have that, the, the, the time you have off is the time you have off when you're a teacher. You can't really go, Hey, we're going to, well, I have done this, but you can't really <laughs> for two weeks in October. Uh, but if it was a normal job, maybe you, you could use your time off to do <clears throat> that, whatever the time of year was. So I don't, there's never going to be a perfect balance. I don't think unless that trust fund comes in, but uh, yes, I, I think that ultimately I like the idea of being able to live where I want to live. Man. Well, we should probably start wrapping up. Do you have any final sort of thoughts or questions for me regarding creativity and parenting or anything? Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, I think we kind of covered the stuff that we had discussed a little bit beforehand. You know, you talked about how creativity, well, at least how your making practice changed. How, I guess, do you feel like you're you're wanting for more creativity ever? Because kids take up so much bandwidth and and creativity does too. So how does that work for you now? I sometimes worry because I feel like I, when I got this, 
when you're when you're seeking jobs and you're in the hustle, you're in the grind. And so I think I was hitting a stride before taking this tenure track position. Um, and at the same time, so I took this job two days into the job. I, I gave birth to my first child and I've had two in the eight years that we've been here. And so um, my art making has definitely taken, you know, I've been sustaining it, but it's definitely taken a back seat to my job and my family. And so I've been trying. Um, so I feel like I was sort of losing steam, I think, in the field. Um, and it's because there's always amazing makers coming up behind you. And um, I mean, I've stayed busy, of course, but and there's always going to be part of your process that is a bit of a slog to get through. I think every maker has that part of their their making practice that they don't enjoy. Um, and yours has sort of become all all consuming in your making practice. Um, I still very much am hungry for the studio. And so I'm I'm very thankful that I still have that urge and desire to create. Uh, but yeah, so in addition to my two children at home, every semester I have 30 children, you know, who are, um, you know, asking me, you know, what's the meaning of life? Um, they're coming out. They're showing me their hives. They're yeah. like, you look at this rash. What is it? <laughs> yeah. You know, like I, I love that I am a professor that is approachable and accessible, uh, but boundaries is something I'm definitely always working on with my students. Uh, because I have to remind them I'm not their mother and I'm not prepared to be their their mom in that way. But I do think being around younger individuals who are learning so much about themselves and therefore their making process is really exciting. And it's really exciting to try to help them make their work better and stronger and more visually pleasing and, and visually engaging and thinking and especially in a place that's rural right now, like there's, they don't get to tap into the bigger art world that much. And so trying to get them to think beyond the pedestal and beyond, you know, just the white walls of a gallery and how they can make a, a statement that reaches beyond the the studio here um, at the university is really exciting. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to, um, but also your creativity, I think has manifested in ways that we can see in in the courses that you've developed because you just talked about exposing these students to more than just what is right here and i think that what is it going to be the third new york trip or fourth It'll be the fourth the fourth yeah so yeah in 2015 just a year after i got here i realized that students were only they were graduating some of them with art history degrees and had never seen art in person really beyond the the university or the the slides that were projected in front of them so I created a class that takes place in New York City every May, and it's we spend eight days doing um, traditional and non-traditional art-related things, and that's really exciting. Uh, it's sort of an, a cultural enrichment course, and it exposes them to a lot. And then um, in 2017, I developed an art activism and social movements course because I realized students were creating work but had no way of being able to contextualize their work in the greater art world because they were so removed um, from what was happening in the political, social, economical climate that we all live in. And so that class has been the hardest class I've ever taught, but it's uh, really eye-opening and it's become so popular that the university made it into a general studies course. And those are just two of the classes um, I've done. And so for me, I think that those are ways of using my creativity in other ways, teaching workshops in the summer and stuff too. But yeah, I think time is is always uh, the hard thing to get because I definitely have ideas um, and I don't quite have the time to see them through yet. Uh, but also my children are growing up so quickly and changing so fast that there will be time to explore those ideas or those process, you know, like I, I really want to learn more about casting, um, but it's, you know, that's a whole beast. Um, and uh, I don't have the time right now if I want to continue making and showing too. Like I just, so I'm going to put that aside and I will explore it when I, when I have the time and, and energy and resources to do that. 
and giving yourself grace to be like, okay, you know, I'm not saying no forever, but I'm going to, you know, have to ignore that for now because this, that I already have, I'm already wearing too many hats, but yeah. Yeah. I think sustaining creativity when you're spread so thin is something that every maker and parent will, will deal with, or, or even if you're not a parent and you're just in academia and a maker, it's, it's really hard uh, because so much of your energy goes to your job. And so I think establishing boundaries and um, learning to say no, that's something I'm really, really bad about. I'd like to emphasize that for people. Yeah, I'm As really someone bad. who witnessed Mallory like get tenure and promotion early, learn to say no. You don't need to say yes to everything. It's not yeah, because it's it's not always worth it. Um, because then you also find that your your work isn't half you know as strong as it could be if, if you had less obligations um, and things like that. And then ultimately, you know, you're replaceable at these jobs and in the field of ceramics. There's always going to be somebody else. Uh, you know, on the wings, but at home, you're not replaceable. And so I realized when I was just missing so many bedtimes and meal times to be in a meeting or, or something, because I thought it was going to progress me professionally. Ultimately, I realized like, that's, that's not how I want to live my life. And so um, I think giving yourself grace and then permission to make changes and alter the course of your own reality. Um, is uh really you know important yeah so that, that that pretty well sums up some of the things we we talked about well i think we have given you guys enough to chew on today and any angry emails can come right to me yeah send them to <laughs> uh, to to matt but um if you have any questions you know feel free to contact us at mallory weatherall uh, at gmail.com or matthew zimke at gmail.com uh we really appreciate ben giving us this uh opportunity to um talk about our experiences we hope that they are uh helpful and hopeful <laughs> and not um uh, not too overly negative for you guys yeah we really appreciate you guys uh taking the time to listening to the to the show yeah thank you everyone I'd like to thank Matt and Mallory for doing this. It was a pleasure to hear them talk about their experience. We were all residents at the Bray probably in 2013 and then also in 2019 maybe. So I've been lucky enough to run into them in creative environments and spend some time also hiking and biking and doing the things we love to do. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors. That's Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through the Brickyard Network website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week as we continue this series called Meet the Parents. And then after that, we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back for season 12 of this show. So we're Gearing up for next year's season, we're going to have a fun drive and new merch and all the stuff that comes with a new season. So hope you'll tune back in for that in early May. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.